All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I think there will probably be a few more people joining us as we get going, but I wanna be mindful of time. I just wanna start with a reminder to please use the Q&A function if you have questions and we'll do our best to monitor that. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Francesca Dominici. Uh, Dr. Dominici is the co-director of the Harvard Data Science Institute at, the Har at Harvard University and the Clarence James Gamble Professor of Biostatistics and Population and Data Science at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She's an elected member of the National Academy of, Academy of Medicine and the, of the International Society of Mathematical Statistics. Dr. Dominici is an expert in longitudinal data analysis, confounding adjustment, causal inference, and Bayesian hierarchical models, and has made important contributions in each of these areas of statistics. Throughout her career, Dr. Dominici has also established herself as a pioneer in biomedical research, developing and advancing methods for the analysis of large heterogeneous data sets to address important questions in areas ranging from environmental epidemiology and climate change to precision medicine. And she leads an interdisciplinary team whose goals include advancing the science in these areas. Dr. Dominici's product productivity and contributions to the field have been absolutely remarkable. She has co-authored or authored a prolific body of peer-reviewed papers in leading statistical, biomedical, and public health journals. And in 2019 was recognized by Web of Science as one of the most highly cited researchers, ranking in the top 1% of scientists cited in her field worldwide. Her work has been covered by every major media outlet in print and television. Dr. Dominici exemplifies the leadership role statisticians can play in large high impact interdisciplinary research. And in April, 2020, she was awarded the Carl E. Peace Award for Outstanding Statistical Contributions for the Betterment of Society by the American Statistical Association. Dr. Dominici is also an advocate for the career, of advance, uh, the career advancement of women faculty. Throughout her career, she has led efforts to ensure the success of women in STEM. And I know through my experiences working with her on committees that she's very passionate about this. We are really fortunate to have Dr. Dominici with us today. I could, call, I could talk for hours about her accolades and accomplishments, but I think that we'd be, but rather than listening to me talk, I think we should uh, hear her talk entitled, How Much Evidence Do You Need? data science to inform environmental policy during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much for joining us, Francesca. Oh, you're on mute. Here we are. I think I should have figured it out by now, but still. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, but we're only seeing okay. about half of your slide. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm getting okay. it. Okay, is all set now? Perfect. Okay, good. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation and thank you so much for the very, very generous um, introduction. It's really my pleasure to be here and, um, and talk to you all. Um, not many of you will know, but I was supposed to present and come on February 2020, and that was just before the explosion of the COVID. And I canceled because I was ill. And then I found out that actually I had COVID. So uh, it's really, this is for me, it's a really special coming back in a certain way. Um, so um, I wanted to give you a broad overview of the work I've been doing with my colleague. And this is really at the intersection of data, data science, air pollution, climate change, and policy. Um, so one of my first take home message and things I like to always predicate on is that really there is not scientific evidence without data science and it's not data science without data. And so data being forming data science, which provide evidence and from the evidence lead to policy change. And the policy change in this context, and this is a success story of breathing cleaner hair. And so, uh, what I'm showing here is on the left is um, the levels of ambient air pollutants in the air. And on the right is a photo of the skyline in 20 years ago and now. And so you see that thanks to the Cleaner Act, which is a federal law, 
that requires the Environmental Protection Agency to review the national ambient air quality standards every few years and assess the evidence as to whether or not there is harmful effect below the national ambient air quality standard. And if there is evidence that the current standards are not safe enough, by law, the, uh, the, the safety standard needs to be lowered. And so this is really, I would say, a success story in public health of how data empirical evidence epidemiology is informing policy with very positive, uh, very positive results. I've been personally very interested in leading research that also continue to address as whether or not the national ambient air quality standard for fine particulate matter and other pollutants are lower enough to protect public health. So the current national ambient air quality standard in the United States for PM 2.5 are set at 12 microgram per cubic meter. And what we need to address is the question as whether or not level of fine particulate matter below 12 microgram per cubic meter are associated with an increase in mortality risk. And if they, if, uh, they are, then as I said, by law, we need to lower the national ambient air quality standard. Another scientific question, which I'm very interested in, is whether or not some uh, population are at high risk uh, than, um, than others. So I start my, my first slide by saying, first thing is the data, right? Without data, not data that is not data science, not data science that is not empirical evidence to inform policy, right? So I've been spending resources and time and energy and commitment in really buying and linking and cultivating and creating large, rich research data platform. So we have been buying claims from the Medicare and Medicaid services. And so we have created, I call it an open cohort. These are all, you know, all of the Medicare participants in the United States. So there are over 67 million. These are people um, subject older than 65 that are enrolled in the Medicare system. And we have individual level claims data from the year 2000 to 2016. We have just have purchased 2017. Then from them, we record all cause mortality. So the date of, 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 of that, and also every date for every single hospitalization and their cause. We have their date of that. We have the age they enter in the cohort, the year they enter in the cohort, they have race, whether they're eligible for Medicaid, which is a proxy for low socioeconomic status, and then we have their zip code of residence. And so by knowing their zip code of residence, we can also augment the database with um, zip code level covariates that we're getting from the US census and many other information. So to really both develop statistical methodology, but also monitor our population health is paramount that we build a platform where we know how to harmonize and integrate heterogeneous sources of data. And so our data platform basically takes all of the health information from, from the Medicare claims, integrated with socioeconomic information and integrated with environmental uh, information. So to give you a little bit more information about the research platform. So one bucket is all about information on exposure um, and environmental intervention. So exposure to different air pollutants in the air, exposure to greenhouse gases, exposure to wildfire sites, sorry, so exposure to fracking sites, exposure to wildfire smoke or other climate change related environmental exposures. And then we link in time and space to health outcome, as I mentioned, mortality and all cost specific hospitalization. And then we need a lot of information on social uh, behavioral the determinant of health, as we know they are highly correlated with environmental exposure and a strong predictor of the health outcome and so are important confounders. Oh, sorry. Um, so let me spend a little bit of time of a, a really important area of uh, development in data science in the context of, of, of machine learning that it's becoming very popular and has having a huge impact. So this map shows the geographic location of where we monitor uh, the ambient level of the several uh, of the six primary pollutants in the United States. And so we see that we have several thousands of monitoring stations. We're monitoring, you know, 
approximately well, but still there are some geographical areas in the United States where you know the levels of PM 2.5 are not measured, right? They tend to be oversampling the urban area and less in the rural area. Remember, one of the scientific questions is I wanted to assess whether or not exposure to air pollution below the national ambient air quality standard, so a low level is impacting uh, is impacting human health. And so we really wanted to improve exposure assessment. So um, in, through a working group led by my colleague, George Wurz at the Harvard THN, THN School of Public Health, and now this is a really an important field, there is an opportunity to develop a machine learning and deep neural network to improve estimation of ambient level of air pollution for all the continental United States, but also globally. And the idea is that we can leverage information from satellite uh, images, so they measure aerosol optical depth, which is an imprecise measure of air pollution. We have output of atmospheric chemistry model. We have weather information. We have satellite data. Sorry, we have land land use data. We train these uh, these machine learning. Um, with all of this additional information with the, with the monitoring data, and then we are able to predict for one kilometer, one kilometer grid for all of the continental United States for every day, the daily level of fine particulate matter. And so again, this is a really prominent area. There is a colleague of mine, um, Ma Marianti with a very long and pronounceable last name that she knows I can pronounce, but Marianti is a faculty member at, at Columbia in the Department of Environmental Health. And Marianti is leading a fantastic group where actually is combining information from several atmospheric chemistry and machine learning model to be able to predict exposure to fine particulate matter, but also other, other pollutants for all the continental United States. And so through this amazing area of research, we can have very detailed exposure assessment for all the United States. And now we can link to the claims and the Medicare and Medicaid data that we have been um, acquiring and cleaning uh, and, and uh, um, being able to analyze the health impact of these environmental exposures. So a few years ago, this was now in 2017, we published this highly impactful study, in the New England Journal of Medicine, which was the first national study that linked on a national level, especially to find particular matter to the 67 million American enrolled in the Medicare to assess whether there was a relationship between long-term exposure to fine particulate matter and mortality risk, also a level below the national ambient air quality standard. So again, the policy impact is huge because if we show that there is evidence of an increase in mortality risk, a low level, a level below the national ambient air quality standard, again, the EPA will need to uh, re reduce the uh, safety level, which means a stricter regulation for fossil fuel uh, combustion and strict regulation to oil and automobile industry. This study was huge. Uh, we have, as I said, 60 million uh, subjects. We have 460 million person years because this was a repeated measurement over time. We have a 32 million subject that we could study that were living in geographical areas exposed a level below 12, right? The level below the national ambient air quality standard. So this was, let me say, without going too much in the detail of the um, statistical methodology for now, but we analyze these data using, let's say, a standard Cox proportional hazard model. And basically what we found is on the horizontal line is centered uh, the uh, hazard, hazard rate for that for 10 units increase in long-term exposure of fine particulate matter on average for the entire population. So for the all United States, a 10 unit increase in long-term exposure to fine particulate matter leads to a 7.3% increase in, in mortality. So it's center 1.07. What's very interesting was that, and now I think you know, a few years later with everything is happening in COVID, probably less surprising, is that we had that the Afro American have a mortality risk associated with fine particulate matter that were three times higher than the national average. That paper had a tremendous amount of press attention. Uh, remember, we were still under the Trump administration, 
And it was actually highly um, used and cited by Senator Cory Booker, which by the way, after that, we started the collaboration because he was outraged about the environmental disparity issues that was occurring um, and you know, that were being demonstrated um, in our data. One thing I should mention is that um, our study was heavily criticized at that time, and most of the study are criticized, just so you know. And one of the criticism was that we, you know, that we were not um, assessing causality. We were not be able to prove that the increase in mortality risk uh, was caused by PM 2.5 versus other factors. Of course, we adjust for confounding, you know, we use standard regression model, but there were criticism about whether or not we were able to assess causality. So what we did is to further robustify our conclusion, we actually leverage and develop methods for causal inference. And for people that are not familiar, basically method for causal inference allow us to, um, under a certain um, assumption, to make statements about causality from analysis of observational data. So we published the second paper uh, in June 2020. This was co-led by former PhD student of mine, uh, Zhao Hu, and uh, um, a um, faculty member, um, Danielle Brown, in the department, where basically the goal was to reanalyze the entire data platform, uh, but with methods for causal inference. So we have similar data, but just we updated the data up to 2016. So we have you know, the same sample size just with an extended, an extended follow-up. And then we um, have exposure to air pollution on one kilometer, one kilometer grid. We have the better assessment for confounding adjustment, including weather variable. And we have uh, a socioeconomic variable at the census track and at the zip, at, at, at the zip code level. So we adjust, for, we basically have several potential confounders. So, so few individual level confounders, then we have zip code the confounders, then we have meteorological confounders, and then we also adjust for geographic region and calendar year. So what was important now was to reanalyze, and remember we are talking about 570 million records, okay? So we reanalyze the entire database, not only by using standard Cox proportional as our model and also say traditional uh, uh, Poisson regression, but we also went to a step forward and um, develop a new approach in causal inference that is based on generalized propensity score, which I can, um, I'm not gonna go into all, all the nitty gritty, but I will give you the, the references. And then we use an exact matching with respect to the generalized propensity score, a weighting matching and, and, and adjustment by putting generalized propensity score as a covariate. One thing is really important that methods for causal inference can do that traditional regression model cannot do is to uh, look at covariance balance or in this context, because it's covariate are continuous to look as whether or not our ability and uh, by adjusting and matching with generalized propensity store, score, we are eliminating the correlation between the exposure and the confounder. So that means that we are better approximating a randomized trial. So in this figure here, basically the red dots are the correlation between any potential confounders and the exposure to air pollution, just a raw correlation, right? And you see that, you know, calendar year, high school education, population density are all variable that are correlated with exposure to PM 2.5. So that means that are important confounders. Then what we do is that with the, with the green dots are the, the correlation that we measure again after we have matched the zip code exactly using the generalized propensity score. And so after I've done exact matching, you see that these correlations are much, much lower. By breaking the correlation between all of the potential measure confounders and the exposure, really we are more confident that we have adequately adjusted for measure confounding. When we look at the results now, so the, the panel on the left shows the estimates of the odds ratio for the whole population by, again, using the Cox model. Remember the first analysis report a 7% increase in mortality risk. So you see we're still around 7%. Then we have under the Poisson model, 
and then we use it under the three methods for causal inference, and you see they're pretty similar. Now, this one is even more interesting because these are the estimates of the other rate, other ratio, for only for the population that is exposed a level of PM 2.5 below the national ambient air quality standard. So actually we see that the mortality risk for this population is even higher. And the methods for causal inference give estimates of the mortality rate that it's a little lower than the traditional, but higher than the whole population and for sure statistical significance. So basically what we estimate from this model is that by lowering the air quality standard from 12 to 10, we would save 143,000 lives in, in one, one decade. So this really has been, I would say, one of the most recent study on the topic. And I'll, tell, I'll show you in a moment, hopefully it's gonna really inform the policy regulation in lowering the national ambient air quality standard. So this is the conclusion where I, I just told you. And the other important piece of the work that we have been doing, and again, really for people that are interested in causal inference and methodological development, is that we also developed new methodology to estimate the exposure response function between exposure to PM 2.5 and mortality rate being completely non-parametric and um, but having all of the characteristics of uh, and uh, uh, interpretation of being causal exposure response function in terms that we match the, uh, the, the population with respect to all of the potential confounders for every pair of um, exposure that we are compared. Now, all of these important results of harmful effect of fine particulate matter are actually very important within the discussion that's happening right now in Glasgow on climate change. Because this is also a really important point that I wanted to communicate to you all is that climate change and, um, it, sorry, in particular, greenhouse gases and climate change sh share the same air pollution sources, the same sources. So you see on the left are the sources of greenhouse gases emission, on the right are the sources of PM 2.5. So what this means is that if we pass a regulation targeting a lowering the national ambient air quality standard for PM 2.5, we immediately start targeting fossil fuel combustion, which are also the major sources of, of greenhouse gases emission, right? So that means that by regulating PM 2.5, we are not only you know, uh, combating climate change and saving many lives in the future, we are start saving many lives now. The good news, and I, I like to take a little bit of credit on that because of this was informed by our science as well, that the WHO lowered indeed the National Ambient Quality Standard for PM 2.5 from 12 to 10, sorry, from 12 to five micrograms per cubic meter. That has been a huge success in public health. And the Environmental Protection Agency right now through the Biden administration is considering to lower the National Ambient Quality Standard. In fact, this was a communication that was last June. And the other thing that is important you see in this communication is they said, in addition, a number of recent studies have examined the relationship between COVID-19 and air, air pollutants, including PM and potential health implications. Well, indeed, in fact, this is the second topic I'm gonna tell you about, which is about our first study showing the relationship between exposure to fine particulate matter and COVID-19. Uh, 19. We were the first study that came up and showed the evidence of, of, of a link. This was the coverage in the, in the garden. And this was a study also um, led by Zhao, who was a former PhD student. Uh, he's now at Stanford. And then Rachel Natery, which is an assistant professor in, bio, in, in biostatistics. And so basically, you see the importance of having large data platform, because by having this large data platform that I told you about, as soon as the, the pandemic exploded, we were really ahead in trying to address the question of whether long-term exposure to fine particular matter increased the mortality risk for COVID-19. So we published this study um, in, uh, in November, 2020. So yeah, just over a year ago. Um, and by the way, all of the data, this study and all of the code and the, uh, is available, uh, publicly available. So the, um, this study was clearly limited because it was an ecological regression analysis. And we know that this ecological regression analysis cannot provide 
information about individual level relationship. On the other hand, unfortunately, still now, the COVID-19 mortality data, it's not available at individual level. It's only available at the county level. But we wanted to start and actually open a new area of research. Since this study, there are now over 140 studies around the world showing the linkage between PM2.5 and COVID-19, including studies that use individual level data. So this was, in a certain way, from a statistical viewpoint, a pretty straightforward study. We regress county level exposure to PM2.5 to county level COVID-19 mortality rate adjusted for many confounders. We use a random effect or just for different sources of correlation. And we reported that for 10 units increase in fine particulate matter, there was an 11% increase in um, COVID-19. And as I said, this was a very impactful study, which is now cited in the EPA about their uh, thinking of lowering the national ambient air quality standard. The other thing that we have been very interested in doing, um, and this was last summer, to look at link between uh, PM 2.5 from wildfires and COVID-19. As you all, many of you know, um, so especially in the West part of the United States, both summer 2020, which they experienced both wildfires and COVID, and summer 2021, they had also wildfires, horrible type wildfires and COVID, but still, you know, many, fortunately many people were already vaccinated. So we did the study in, in the summer 2020 to look at the relationship between PM 2.5 from wildfires and the COVID-19 cases and deaths. And again, this study is also all of the data and all of the code, um, if you're interested, um, are publicly available and can be used and be, un be analyzed. This was a study that was co-led by Zhao Dan Zhu, which is a data scientist at the Environmental Science Research Institute and Kevin Josie, which is a postdoctoral fellow um, in my lab. Again, we built data platform. We got exposure data for PM 2.5. We used satellite data to identify which day were wildfire smoke day. We took meteorological data. We used Facebook data. We used socioeconomic data, anything that we can get, including, of course, for daily COVID-19 cases and deaths. So this is how the data look like, right? So basically we had, we studied, um, the study period that was from March to uh, this December, 2020 for over 92 counties um, in the Western part of the United States. And so you see for Los Angeles County for every day, the blue dots are the level of fine particulate matter. They, um, orange arrow are the days that to the wildfires were happening. The blue dots are daily number of COVID-19 cases and the, the black dots are daily number of COVID-19 deaths. And so what we wanted to know is whether this high level of fine particulate matter that were happening during the wildfire day were leading to an increase in COVID-19 uh, deaths and cases up to a month later. So first of all, we needed to do some sort of counterfactual analysis to figure out how much of the PM 2.5 were due to the wildfires versus how much of the PM 2.5 would have been occurring anyway, right? So this is a, a time series counterfactual analysis, a very simple idea, but powerful, right? So basically the, the, the blue dots were the level of fine particulate matter on 2020. Right, and so um, and so you see that, for example, during these days so we had these wildfire days, and this level of PM two point five were really high, right? And then the black line at the level of fine particulate matter for the same county, this is Los Angeles, for the same period, but for previous years, and in days where we knew there were no wildfires, right? So, in other words, if you take a single day you see that this, 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 this date here that I'm putting with my cursor, the, the, the black line will tell me what the PM 2.5 would have been if wildfire did not occur, right? So we wanted to see what is the extra PM 2.5 we do the PM 2. Point, sorry, what's the extra level of PM 2.5 achievers of the wildfires, whether or not that's causing extra number of COVID-19 cases and deaths. 
We build based on a practical model and integrate information from data sources. We also account for delayed because you could have the high level of PM 2.5 of the wildfire today could lead an increase in COVID-19 deaths up to a month later, right? So these are the percentage increase in COVID-19 cases and deaths up to one month later for every single county attributable to an increase in PM 2.5. And so although there are few counties where you see a protective effect, for the majority of the county, you see a positive a statistical significant association and definitely a positive a statistical significant association overall. So what we found overall was like extra 20,000 COVID-19 cases and extra 740 deaths were attributable to this high level of PM 2.5 that happened in the summer 2020 due to the wildfires. And so corroborating further the hypothesis that in presence of very high level of pollution, the virus could spread faster. And also because people are compromised uh, because of being breathing smoke could also increase the risk of, of deaths. One thing I'm really proud of, which I'm, I'm a big fan of data visualization and data platform, we did build, which again, you can find um, as a link to the paper, we built this data, um, this data platform and data visualization, which was really important to be used by the public health agency. So basically you can click in any of the county affected to the, by, the, by the wildfires. And so you can see for that particular county, the ambient level of fine particulate matter, which is the yellow, the level of fine particulate matter that was attributable to the wildfires. And then you see the, the daily time series of the COVID-19 cases and deaths. And estimate the level of PM 2.5 that occurred during the wildfire days and during the non-wildfire case and give you the extra number of cases that were attributable to the spike and the extra number of uh, deaths. And so you can do that for any counties. And so our office will continue to monitor and up, update these uh, data platform. In another study, which again is very much connected to climate change uh, and the discussion that happened in Glasgow, we, again, this was in an international collaboration, we wanted to assess of the percentage of the total number of deaths for COVID-19, what's the percentage, sorry, among the total number of deaths of COVID-19, what is the percentage of these deaths that were attributable to air pollution in particular to fossil fuel related emission and all anthropogenic emission? And we found that it's 13% in Europe, only 2% in Africa, 15% in East Asia and 14% in North, uh, North America. And so you can see that there is really a direct intersection and you know, dangerous intersection between fossil fuel combustion and the, uh, and the virus. Now, for the last part of my talk, I want to dig a little bit deeper in terms of the data science and the statistical and biostatistical considerations. So, you know, in the field of data science, we transition from having an hypothesis and collecting the data to actually having the data first. And then after we have been bombarded with this data, how we can make sense, right? So that means that most of the time we're dealing with observational studies. And by the way, it's, you know, it's impossible to do a randomized study of climate change or of environmental exposure. So how do we assess causality in the context of large and messy observational data? So there are a lot of unresolved data science challenges in the type of area that I've been talking to you about. So first of all, and I'm gonna give you like just a few examples. I think there is still a ton of work that we need to do on uncertain quantification and propagation. We have to continue to develop rigorous methods for causal inference, so then we can really assess the um, credibility and uh, making sure that our, when we attribute a uh, health impact to some behavioral or environmental determinants of health, we know that we have established cause and effect. And then we need to continue to push forward for reproducibility and transparency of, of the research fundings. So I'm, I am really delighted in a certain way, grateful and blessed that I work with phenomenal students, junior faculty and postdoctoral fellow. This is just like some collection of 
work that has been published uh, in the statistical literature or is under review, we really with the idea of developing machine learning and cause of inference methods to assess the public health efficacy of intervention or identify the most vulnerable subgroups to, to certain contaminant outcomes, also as well to deal with highly multivariate outcomes. So the last component also I wanna mention is that we really wanted to deal with reproducible workflow. And so it's really important, especially when you are gathering, managing and integrating and harmonizing this large data that how you get from the raw data to the analytic data is, is documented. And this is you know, easy to say, but really hard to do. And it's a lot of work, but it is paramount for um, for the rigor of, of the science and also to be able to trace back what, uh, what, what you have done. So some of the work I've been talking is by no means all my work. This is the results of, we have a beautiful and very effective and productive consortium of different PI from different institutions. They are now relying on the research data platform that I told you. And what's important is that there are a lot of postdoctoral fellow students um, of you know, both PhD, master and undergraduate that can take advantage of the research platform to do additional investigation. So these are just some of the, the people, some that you might um, recognize, especially when I mentioned Michelle Bell, Joel, Joel, George Wars, Marianti, Greg, uh, Gregory Lenius and Antonella Zanobetti. And these are all some of the, you know, of the members between student and postdoctoral fellow, uh, they are working on the, on, on the platform. So I think just to have a few, you know, final conclusion. So the steps needed to make, mitigate climate change in future are substantially the same as those needed to reduce the burden of that and disability to do air pollution in the present, which is really cut back on, bus, on burning fossil fuel and biomass. In the meantime, machine learning and data science allow us to measure exposure and pinpoint vulnerability and susceptibility. And so also methods for causal inference allow us to better disentangle causes from confounders, especially in the context of the natural disaster. And I wanted to mention uh, that, you know, this year Nobel Prize in uh, economic was actually to Angris and Imbens for the development of method for for, uh, for, for, uh, for causal inference. So um, looking ahead, I, I, you know, for me, I wanted to offer a data science perspective. I think it's really important to develop a research data platform and allow you know, to do this work in a rigorous manner, to link spatial temporal data on meteorolog meteorology, climate, air pollution, satellite, and again, to a quantify linkage to health indicator. And also it's really important, which I had a chance to talk about much, to uh, understand the distribution of effect on disadvantaged population. I, I just want to have also a little advertisement is that my lab is hiring data engineering, software engineering, postdoctoral fellows and master level statisticians. So if you go on the website, you will find all of this. And then I can never finish my lecture without mentioning and a photo of my two dogs. <laughs> These are two ladies and Tilly and, and Dory and a little bit of joke where one said, hey, do you think she will find out how much methane are we meeting? I hope not. I hope you're laughing. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Francesca. We already have a question in the, in the Q&A. So please remember if you wanna ask questions, put them in the Q&A. So data about ongoing public health emergencies is usually collected by local public health departments whose budgets keep shrinking. What is the future of public health data science without investments in quality data collection? Since they are separate from academia, what can we do as academics to advocate for this? Yeah, that's 100% agree and 100% correct. I think that you know we need to do everything that we can to advocate for better data collection. Um, writing letters, presenting a conference, uh, contacting your um, representative, because it's, um, it's at the foundation 
uh, it's the foundation and, and in, in enabling us to do good science. So I've been saying that fortunately, I think our new administration, the Biden administration is very um, responsive to that. So I've been very encouraged and optimistic about you know, how they're thinking about this problem. But yes, I mean, um, it is important. Um, don't forget though that, of course I completely agree that public health agency have a huge role in this, but they're not the only one. So we can now collect data from many data sources as well. So, um, I do think that even if the, the budget for public health agency doesn't increase and it should, I do think that we can still you know, manage to do very, very good research. But yeah, so I think we should be as loud as clear about the importance of data as much as we can. So thank you. Another question, uh, Dr. Gracely wants to know how you chose the one month lag for wildfires to death. One might think that smoke would kill people in late stages of COVID, was the thinking that pollution increases the risk of getting COVID or the severity of COVID? Yeah, it's a good question. So both. Um, so first of all, um, we wanted, so in, in the first study that we did on air pollution and COVID, we looked at whether long-term exposure to PM 2.5. So, so whether, for example, if you have been living in air and been breathing pollution for very long time, and then you're getting COVID, then are you at risk to having more severe COVID, right? So the first study was really about air pollution and COVID severity. The second study on wildfires, we want to also look at whether having high level of fine particulate matter also will increase the number of cases. And so um, up to one month, to be honest with you, was pretty much arbitrary in terms of was the longest that um, we could look at uh, without getting into other confounding by seasonality and changing in policy, right? But we were really interested to see if there was a link with the increased number of cases, and there was, and, uh, and actually pretty high. And that's been very interesting because, again, in the context of COVID, um, there is now, now has been accepted that the virus is airborne, Remember, at the beginning, it wasn't, right? At the beginning, that was, was an hypothesis that was rejected. Now it's been endorsed, including endorsed by the WHO. And on top of that, several scientists have been hypothesizing that because it's airborne, when you have levels, high level of particles, actually the virus attached to the, part attached to the particles and the particle becomes a vehicle for further spread. So the results of our study were consistent with, um, with that hypothesis. So we choose one month to mostly to look at whether the link with COVID cases recognized it was probably too short. So that means really that it's possible that the impact on deaths would have been higher, but that was not really the main question. The question was really cases, but yeah, but I agree with you. That's, that was, you know, there was something that required a lot of thinking. So there's several more questions coming in. Some are a little lengthy, so bear with me as I as I read through them. So anonymous uh, member of the audience wants, says, thank you so much for your presentation. So glad you finally made it, which I agree. We're so glad you finally made it. Uh, this question is about exposure measurement. The new prediction models to estimate pollution that are highly spatially and temporally resolved are impressive. How, however, health outcome models are ultimately uh, using exposure measures that are aggregated, for example, to zip code since pa patient data are at that scale. If measures were available for one's residents or for person measures, would that actually be preferable and or policy relevant? And exposure what is the policy unit. relevant of the exposure unit? Yeah, great question. So, there's been a lot that's been, you know, taught and discussed about this, right? So, so um, pros and cons. So first of all, um, you know, right now we are able to assess exposure to our pollution up to one kilometer to one kilometer grade. And I think that that's pretty much the best we'll be able to do. I mean, 
let's face it, I don't know, but I don't see in the next few years where we can start measuring air pollution level for everyone to, for 20 years, right? Maybe, maybe you know, with our watches, but you know, it's not going to happen anytime soon. And also, um, I think I think one kilometer is a pretty good approximation. Uh, but yes, I agree with you. It's not perfect. Now the question is, so but. The level, the amount of exposure error plays an important role depending on what is the scientific question that we, we are addressing. If the scientific question is clinical, so for example, I want to know what is the level of inhalation of PM 2.5 that's going to give me an heart attack, right? That's, yes, I mean, you need, you know, it's like smoking a cigarette, right? I want to get my personal inhalation of PM 2.5. If the question is policy, it's different because the policy question, remember the Environmental Protection Agency is supposed to regulate ambient level of PM 2.5, right? So if I am at home and I am grilling a steak and burning meat every night, I'm gonna breathe 200 microgram per cubic meter PM 2.5. That's not, that's not our government fault, that's your fault, right? So I think that when assessing ambient level of fine particulate matter with the highest possible level of accuracy is really what we are trying to do for the policy relevant question. By any means, it's not perfect and it's never gonna be perfect because the claims data, we only know the zip code of residents, right? So ultimately this information is linked at a zip code level. But on the other hand, I, I do feel that that's really the best we can do for a very long time. And then now the question becomes, are we underestimating or overestimating this health effect? And then both statistical theory and epidemiological evidence has been telling us that by aggregating it, actually it's likely that we are underestimating this effect. So if we are detecting harmful effect at low level, using data aggregated at the zip code level, you know, it's pretty, you know, it's very likely that the fact is gonna be even higher at the individual level. And so, uh, and finally, let me, add, let me add that, even though the data are linked to the zip code level, we do leverage all individual level information by calculating stratified counts by age, gender, race, demographic, and socioeconomic, um, so, socioeconomic studies. So, you know, there are, there are plus and minus, and by no means, this, you know, the science is perfect, but no science is perfect. So, so staying on the theme of policy, we have two other, two questions, both about policy and decision makers. And so Dr. Moore says, Dr. Namanichi, thank you for the excellent presentation and all you've done for our field and for public health. You mentioned that Senator Cory Booker noticed your study, spoke publicly about the disparity and now you two are engaged in a collaboration. Can you briefly say more about this collaboration and in general, how we can engage in fruitful collaborations with policymakers to decrease health disparities and facilitate justice, equity, and inclusive change for public health? And then the next question is similar along the same lines, wanting to know about how you think that input from the community, the constituents in the form of citizen sciences can make a difference. Yeah, great questions. So I have learned a ton throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And then again, it's really how once again, crisis becomes an opportunity. So um, Senator Booker office and his staffer uh, contacted me and, you know, and again, you know, there is actually, if you're, if you're curious, you go on my website, there is a video of, of Senator Booker cross-examine a candidate for an, an administrative position at the EPA and uh, mentioning and talking about our study and specific, specifically of how outraged it was that Afro-Americans were suffering from exposure to fine particulate matter at such high level, which now, you know, in a certain way, and, and it becomes even less surprising. That doesn't mean that that's right, you know, because of all of you know all the tragedy of the COVID nineteen. So they contacted me because they wanted to learn more about what we were doing, and this has been a 
phenomenal learning opportunity for me and my team because basically actually they helped us to actually took an even a step back. And instead of looking at whether the relationship between PM and mortality was different among different races, they want to get a more a better understanding of whether or not there were environmental disparities. So this racial disparity in terms of the level of pollution that the, the different racial groups breathe, but also they want to get um, a better understanding as to whether implementation of regulatory policy were benefiting everyone equally. And um, we actually wrote um, as a result of these exchanges, and the reason was because the Senator Booker, actually Kamala Harris, wanted to pass a bill that made the point that when you implement a regulatory action, you don't only need to look at the benefit on average for everybody, but you need to make sure that the, the, the beneficial consequences of implementing this action are the same for everyone. And it's not only gonna benefit the people that are, you know, the white population and the richer people. So um, bottom line is we wrote a paper which will be published soon uh, in Nature. And I didn't present it today because I couldn't that talked about that really was a result of that collaboration. And it's a data visualization paper and I can tell you the bottom line is that I started my first slide saying that the, the levels of our pollution in the hair have been declining, right? So good news. Well, unfortunately, there is a bad news. They have not been declining at the same rate for everybody. They've been declining faster for the white people and the rich people and much slower for the most vulnerable and underrepresented minorities. So that's is feeding back to the bill because now if they are reducing the national ambiental quality standard, and let's hope they do, they cannot, they're not done. They need to reduce the national ambiental quality standard, but then there is a second piece of work in making sure the implementation of the regulatory policy are, you know, the, the implementation is done equally so that everyone uh, takes that benefit. So it's um, it has been high opening to interact with um, people like both in politics and in policy and understanding their viewpoint and understanding what type of scientific evidence they need. Because sometimes in academia, we tend to work in silos and we spend years in doing research that that is not what they need to know, right? And again, purposely this work, this paper that you will see, nothing complicated. It's just data visualization because we wanted to be able to send a message that everyone could see it with their own naked eye. And so for the second part then, what can we as, as citizens or sci citizen scientists do as constituents to help um, to help with make a difference working with policymakers and decision makers from your perspective? Well, I think if, you know, first of all, I think we should never shy, uh, you know, run away from having in, for being able to explain to them scientific findings um, so I think, you know, so if the question is coming from people that are working in public health, I do think is now becoming our responsibility to engage in intellectual, not advocacy conversation. I mean, of course, people can do advocacy, but as a scientist, I do think it's important that we don't only do the science, but also we explain the science. Um, um, and so I think that science communication and science translation, including being transparent about the uncertainty and how the, the fact that the science evolved, I think it's really important to regain the trust in science so that I feel we have lost. Um, and then I do think that both as a citizen, as a public health expert, I do think that we can 
um, balance our own personal political preferences and opinion with scientific findings. And again, help the general public to interpret it and also help and guide people to learn from trustworthy sources of science and untrustworthy sources of science. I think that's great advice. <laughs> uh, we've all seen the harm of untrustworthy science. Uh, one last question, uh, Dr. Faliano wants to know, in subsequent analyses of the Medicare data set, have you continued to see the striking dif difference in the impact of PM 2.5 between African American and other populations that you saw in the first study? Yeah, unfortunately, this is a pretty consistent findings. Um, the Afro American population tends to have higher vulnerability to exposure PM 2.5, exposure to other pollutants, exposure to wildfires, um, heat. Um, and so it's it's definitely a vulnerable population. And now there is there could be the one of the factors because there tends to be higher comorbidity rate. Um, and so they, you know, they have higher incidence of cardiovascular disease. And so again, you know, that's that's as an element of vulnerability. Other elements, it could be for lack of access or less access to healthcare. But it's definitely, unfortunately, a consistent funding among many studies. Thank you. I just want to thank you again for joining us this afternoon and for taking the time to meet with people in our school and our community. And um, it's been your, your talk was amazing. And it's been a real pleasure to have you with us, Francesca. Thank you so much. It was really great. And thank you for the wonderful, wonderful question. So thank you for having me. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.